Good evening, everyone. Um, that is good evening for those of you in Israel um, and uh, perhaps in Europe. And good afternoon for those of you joining us from North America. Uh, my name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow here at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. Um, I believe that most of the people on this uh, in this meeting have attended these before, uh, though I'm aware there are some uh, newcomers. Um, but just I will briefly uh, explain that we have been since uh, we've been unable to have physical events here at the center uh, since uh, March, basically, uh, we've been running uh, Zoom sessions, including a weekly um, session in English on a Wednesday. Um, and we've explored all manner of topics relating to uh, Israeli history and politics and contemporary, uh, contemporary Jewish issues. Um, and uh, we've had a number of wonderful uh, guests uh, from the world of uh, politics and academia and uh, civil activism. Um, and we're joined today by, by yes, another of those who I will introduce momentarily. Um, this is the final part of a four part series that we have been running um, on the four tribes of modern Israel, which takes its, its name and its topic from a famous speech given by President Ruby Rivlin uh, five years ago, uh, six years ago now, um, in which he uh, expressed grave concern at the, at the division in Israeli society. And he, the way he framed it was in looking at what he called the four tribes, which as we've discussed in previous, um, in previous meetings like this is a sort of oversimplification uh, but I think makes it makes an important point, um, which is essentially to divide the country into the four streams which have their own separate streams in the in the Israeli education system. That is the secular Jews, um, uh, ultra Orthodox Jews, religious Zionist Jews and Israeli Arabs. Um, so we've been looking uh, at the first, we've looked at the three Jewish um, tribes uh, and we are now turning to uh, the fourth tribe, which is the the one non-Jewish tribe of the four, uh, the Israeli Arab population of Israel, some 20% um, of Israel's population that we'll hear about uh, from our speaker. And of course, um, there are uh, very different, unique um, issues relating to um, the, the relationships between uh, that 20% and the uh, somewhat short of 80% Jewish majority, um, which we'll explore um, this evening. Uh, so we're going to have a, I'm going to have a conversation for a um, short period with, um, with our speaker and then the, the floor is open for your questions which you can write into the chat box um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so I will, without further ado, introduce our speaker. I'm very um, happy and uh, honoured to welcome uh, Mohammed de Rauscher to, um, to the Begin Center Zoom uh, program. Uh, Mohammed is, uh, has been since uh, 2014 the Director of Equality and Shared Society at the Givat Chaviva Educational Center, uh, which is an institution in the north of Israel uh, dealing with issues of uh, Jewish Arab coexistence and democracy and equality. Um, prior to that, he was for eight years the co-director of the Abraham Fund initiatives um, which uh, is a well-known and well-established uh, organization also dealing with issues of, of Jewish-Arab um, um, coexistence and specifically um, Arab equality issues. Uh, he's had a long uh, a career before that also in politics, uh, working with various um, political parties. Um, he was a parliamentary assistant in the Knesset. Um, he's um, someone who I think is one of the uh, probably one of, the, one of the most long-standing and uh, well-regarded um, civil activists uh, on this issue uh, in Israel. Um, he's also someone that I've known for a while. Um, we actually had the pleasure of meeting in London many, many years ago <laughs> um, when I was um, quite a bit younger um, and working at the Israeli embassy uh, in London. And uh, it's uh, every time I bump into him, and have the opportunity to bring him to to speak to um, programs I'm involved in uh, here. It's always um, it's always my pleasure and privilege to do so. So, without further ado, Mohammed, thank you. Welcome. 
Thank you very much. Uh, good evening and good uh, morning, good afternoon, whatever, which time zone you are in. Great pleasure to be with you, Paul, uh, as always. Okay, so um, let's start with a, with, a, with a general question. So um, th there's a, I think there's a, there's a certain, there's a diversity of uh, backgrounds and knowledge among the audience here, but let's just clarify that we're talking about the about Arab citizens of Israel. That is the the Arab population that lives within the the Green Line within the pre sixty seven borders of Israel. We're not talking about the Arab Palestinian population in Gaza and the West Bank. Um, we're talking about those Arabs that became uh, and, and their descendants, of course, that became citizens of Israel um, after the War of Independence uh, within the the those original borders of the state of Israel. Um, can, you, can you tell us what, Mohammed, what, what sort of numbers are we talking about? How many people are we talking about? And what are the, what are the contemporary um, issues that are sort of exercising the, the Israeli Arab sector? Well, uh, Paul, let's do a bit of a slicing of the Arab community in, inside Israel. Please. 17% uh, are citizens and 4% are not citizens. The four percent are those residents of East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. Uh, they became Israeli residents uh, in 1967 when Israel uh, took over East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights in the war of 1967. While uh, the rest of the population, the 17 percent, are the descendants of the same 17 percent of the Arab citizens that became citizens. That on, on 1948. Actually, no one was citizen in 1948. The citizenship law was in 1949, in January 1949. So those counted in 1949, the census of 1949. Uh, and uh, I'm, we're basically talking about my grandfather's generation uh, as the adults of that period. My father in 1948 was seven years old. My mother was only two years, uh, was only three years old. So it's the first generation uh, Arab citizens, uh, where 166,000 leftovers of the Palestinian people. That's who we are. People that were either too far in the mountains, and at the time, 70% of this population was living in the uh, in the Galilee. A big portion, a smaller portion, about 10%, was living uh, in the in, in the south, in the Negev. Uh, and uh, the issue of uh, what's called the triangle didn't even exist. There were no Umm al-Fahim in Israel. There was no Taibi in Umm al-Fahim in Israel, neither Baq al -Garbiya. Those were added to Israel in the ceasefire agreement in 1949. So there's one group that came in in 1948, another group that came in in 1949, and then a third group in 1967. But those that came in 1967, they were never... Uh, they do not have their citizenship. So they do not have an Israeli passport and they do not have an Israeli uh, the right to vote to the Knesset. Uh, the citizens of Israel uh, continue to live mostly in the same towns and villages. Uh, at the beginning, Israel's uh, policy was what was called at the time containment to contain this population because the state, although the Declaration of Independence offered uh, the gesture of welcoming Arab citizens to be part of the state of Israel. And uh, even uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence has a clause that uh, calls upon my grandfather's generation, come be part of the building of the newly born state, the state of the Jewish people, the Jewish state. And in exchange, you will get three things, social, economic, and political equality. And there was even a discourse for a number of years about what is the meaning of political equality. Uh, Jabotinsky was saying political equality means that we should offer the Arab citizens a consensual democracy, which means a, a fair representation, adequate representation, including a statutory deputy prime minister as an Arab deputy prime minister in the state of Israel. Jabotinsky's line lost, Mapai's Mapa line won. And Mapai said, okay, Meanwhile, we are not sure we want to maintain this big of a number of Arab citizens. Let's contain them within their own towns and villages. Let's impose on them military administration so 
that they do not integrate in Israeli society. We want to keep them separate from the rest of the Jewish population in their own towns and villages, because one day maybe we will need to do population exchange. We will, might need to give them to the Arab world in exchange of getting the Jews from uh, Arab countries. This notion lasted uh, uh, until 1966. That's when the state of Israel realized this population is here to stay. It's not going to disappear. The exchange option is not really on the table. By that time, most uh, Sephardi Jews have come to Israel. And Israel started actually the process of what I would start, what would call the Israelization process, legitimizing Arab citizens, citizens, eliminating the military administration, starting civic relationship with Arab citizens, relating to Arab citizens as citizens that are here to stay and they're not a military leftover of the war of independence that the state wants to get rid of them. And so we started the process of Israelization of a Palestinian community. Uh, and uh, But I would dare say that the year after 1967, when, uh, when a new Palestinian group was added into the pool of Israel's control, which is the West Bank and Gaza and the Golan Heights, uh, another process of what I would call re-Palestinization re re kicked in. So since then, we're going through those two uh, parallel tracks. Israelization, which is happening every single day. Re-Palestinization, which to some extent reached a peak and it's sort of slowing down, uh, uh, trying to keep the Palestinian identity more as a cultural identity the Israeli identity becoming more and more dominant as a civic, social, uh, uh, and economic identity. You know, we, we live in Israel as part of the state of Israel, and the, the process of integration started bouncing back to become much, much more significant. To those of you in Israel, I hope you will not get sick, but if you do get sick and you go to a hospital, you'll find that 23% of the doctors in Israeli hospitals are Arab, 32% of the nurses are Arab, and 35% of the dentists are Arab. Ask Paul, my niece is a dentist treating his daughter. Uh, and 55% of the uh, pharmacists. So if you want to look at an island, a successful island of integration in the medical industry, it's screaming. We are over represented 55% while we are only 17% of the population in the medical industry, we're almost one third overall in the different uh, medical positions, we're almost one third of the medical staff in the state of Israel. And this has actually become much more dominant and obvious during the uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, in the state. Okay, so in the current situation in Israel, um, certainly as um, I think many uh, outside observers look 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 on. Um, they they see um, criticism from uh, from the Arab community and its supporters and its advocates. We say of um, in of various various levels of it, various issues of inequality regarding um, Arab participation in. Um, in Arab, Arab employment figures, especially Arab women, um, and also Arab um, participation in higher education, in universities. Um, can you speak to that? Is that something that, firstly, is that is that static? Is that improving? Is it getting worse? Um, and where do you, to what do you attribute that? Well, there's no question that there is discrimination. Uh, even President Rivlin, when he gave his speech, the, the four tries speech, he uh, used the word that the negligence uh, of the state of Israel uh, to equality uh, policies towards Arab citizens borders uh, uh, criminal negligence because it's not only harming the Arab citizens, it's harming the state as a whole. Uh, and unfortunately, there have been uh, many uh, structural discriminatory uh, decisions of the state against Arab citizens that I, you know, I would start counting 1966. Before 1966, that was the military period that was not a civic relationship. But yeah. since 1966, that's my independence day when I became a legitimate citizen. 
from my point of view, Israel became a democracy in 1966. Until that moment, it cannot say that it's a democracy by while maintaining 17% of its population under military rule, under some kind of a martial law where you couldn't move only because you're not Jewish. So from that, I can I refer to the last uh, uh, the years from 1966 till today. The policies in social economic terms have failed. Uh, I will talk about the trends, the question that you asked. But first of all, the bottom line of it today is that 50% of Arab citizens inside Israel are below poverty line. Every second Arab citizen in Israel is below the national poverty line. Among the Jewish population, it's less than 13%. Among Arabs, it's 50%. And this is not in, uh, incidental poverty. It is a, a result of uh, policy, mostly policy of negligence. The state has never came up to this issue. Or, well, we care first of all about our own, our own being Jewish, not Israeli. The, the whole concept of Israeliness, which becomes secondary to Jewishness, the ethnic identity of the state that takes over the civic identity of the state. This creates some kind of, of a two-layer society when it comes to government decisions. There are at least, I mean, and the government, or governments, I'm sorry, not this specific government, but governments in general, they have passed 67 different uh, laws uh, and decisions to improve the quality of Arab citizens in order to bring Arab citizens towards equality. If those, if those same Israeli government decisions are to be fulfilled, they will solve probably 97% of the problems of our citizens. We don't need research centers. We don't need the UN to tell us what to do. We don't need the EU to tell us what to do. And now we're not the US government to tell us what to do. Israeli government has discussed the issue 67 times and came, and came up with master plans. There was only one significant master plan that actually started moving. It resulted from the creation in 2007 of something called the Authority for Economic Development of the Minority Sector, which basically allocates funds to the Arab towns and villages, trying to catch up, trying to close the gaps in, in certain areas, uh, mostly in infrastructure development, sewage systems, uh, zoning planning, uh, allowing people to get permits to build homes, so we get rid of the problem of illegal house, building of houses, uh, problems of uh, uh, employment, education, uh, municipal services. Most of the new money that is coming in is going there. And actually we're beginning to see a trend that when the government focuses in investments in certain areas, it starts closing some of the gaps. And I'll, I'll give you maybe a couple of examples. In 2007, uh, the percentage of Arab women in the, uh, that worked, that created the second income in an Arab household in Israel, was only 17%. Only 17% of Arab women in the age of employment, which is usually counted as 15 to 62, only 17% of them worked. Today, 41% of them work. That's an addition of 68,000 new Arab women that entered the labor market which means that 68,000 families moved from the below the poverty line to above the poverty line. In 2007, poverty rate in the Arab, poverty rate in the Arab community was 68%. Today, it's 47%. It's huge. I mean, it's a drop of 21%. But, but imagine only 13 years ago, we were talking about two thirds of Arab citizens below the poverty line. I mean, the, and and it, it did take a government intervention, because how do you get Arab women to work when there's no employment in poor Arab towns? You need to provide them public transportation to the nearby Jewish towns. Public transportation was only between Arab towns and Arab towns, between an unemployment center and another unemployment uh, uh, neighborhood. You needed to transfer uh, some knowledge to them to work in a Jewish employment market, meaning master the language of Hebrew. So you cannot go with a broken Hebrew to work on a cash uh, uh, station in a supermarket in a Jewish town. So you needed to improve their Hebrew skills. Uh, you needed to give them some uh, uh, maybe computer skills. 
And because, you know, even if you want to work in a cash machine, it's so computerized that you can't just come from basic education. So in order, you needed to invest in education so that you can improve the quality. One of the big decisions that the state took in, in 1992 under the Rabin government was accessibility to high school education. Uh, at the time, less than 20% of Arab girls went to high school. The fact that high schools were, were built as a result of a decision of Arab girls, you know, let's get rid of negligence and start attending to Arab citizens and treat them as legitimate citizens and equal citizens in the field of education, that you know, high schools were started being built in Arab towns. And the percentage of Arab female students increased from 20% in 1992 to 60% of our student population, more female students in Arab high schools than male students. This is now has transcended to the university. In 2007, when universities were discriminating much, much more, the percentage of, I'm sorry, 2003, when universities were discriminating much, much more against Arab citizens, our student population was only three and a half percent of the university student population. Today, we are 18% of the university student population. So in, in 17 years, we, we made, we basically, how much is that? Is that quadrupling? It's more. I don't know how do you say five drupling, but it's five times more within 17 years. It tells you that this is a hungry population, hungry for education, hungry for employment, hungry for integration, hungry to become Israelis. They're coming into Israeli universities to become like the rest of the Israelis. Uh, two thirds of our student population at university is female, which means that we went through a social shift. Mind, you know, we changed the disquette in our head to say that Arab women are not only good for the uh, kitchen, they're good to go to universities. My daughter is doing her PhD in genetics at the Technion. Our brain power, our female brain power, is being polished and polished and polished. That is showing what potential we have, one for our own selves. So we had to change our perception to the issue of the status of women, female education, girls staying. You know, my daughter studied undergraduate degree at Hebrew University, masters she did in Tel Aviv, and now the PhD at the Techno. It means that she had to sleep outside our home. So for me, it wasn't a big issue because you know, I did have some kind of previous academic uh, degrees in education, but most of the new students have never had a student. Most of them are first generation academics. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're beginning to study topics that are very essential to that and very, re very requested by the Israeli job market. So uh, you see that in, in high tech, for example, in 2007, the percentage of Arab students in Israel studying high tech was only two and a half percent of the students, while being 20%, 21% of the population. Today, we are 22% of the students of high tech. Only 7% of the industry, but the revolution is coming. Those graduates will start knocking the doors of the high tech industry with brain power created in Israeli universities shifting the, uh, uh, the structure of the employment scene in high tech, exactly as we did with, uh, with the medical industry. I, I, I think that finally we started comprehending that we're a minority. We need to work twice as hard than the average Israeli in order to succeed. Uh, and as a result, we're, you know, we're looking for where is the biggest potential, which ladders we can climb are the faster uh, ladders where we can get out of, you know, not to get stay stuck in our misery, but to start, first of all, helping ourselves by, by identifying the potential. Interestingly, uh, uh, Paul, the uh, population growth in the Arab community in the last 13 years has dropped from 4.6% to somewhere around 3.1% in 13 years. Why? Because our young women 
are busy going to university and not making babies. So if you want to reduce the growth rate of the Arab citizens, you don't need to be racist. You don't need to speak against Arab citizens. All what you need to do is give a woman a scholarship and she promises less babies. I mean, one of the, the in, in, to a, in a certain way, what you've described is similar to many minority communities in other countries in the sense of, in, in terms of, both in terms of some of the problems of discrimination and also, and the, and the need to, to, to work twice as hard and, and no one's saying that's how it should be, but that is how it is um, in, in, in Israel and other countries. But I think one, one important difference, uh, which it would be, which I think it would be remiss of me not to at least raise is that in Israel, the, the minority population, the Arab population is, it's not just, um, it's not just an ethnic or racial minority. It's a, it's a, it's a minority which is, with which Israel has a historic, has a history of conflict, has a violent conflict um, with, um, you know, with death and destruction on both sides. And I'm sorry, I, I lost you for a second uh, for some reason. Ah, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm saying that one of the differences, I think, with the with the Arab minority that I think it's important to, to hear your response to is that the Arab minority, unlike some uh, minorities in other countries, is a minority that has a history of conflict with the majority population, or a history of war, a history and, and, a, and a, rea a contemporary reality where Israel is still in a state of conflict with a, with a population with whom that minority has an affiliation. I mean, where, to a lesser or greater extent, and you can talk about that, but I think for, for many Israeli Arabs, and I think, and again, you'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, for, for many or most Israeli Arabs, they feel a sense of kinship with, um, in some cases, literal kinship with the Palestinians with whom Israel is still in a state of conflict in Gaza and the West Bank. And that's a different situation. And whilst it doesn't excuse um, discrimination, I think it, it maybe it, it, it goes some way, I think, to explaining why there is a um, why there is a, a, a more difficulty in integrating Arabs into Israel, Arab, Arab citizens to Israel than there is in, say, I don't know, um, choose your ethnic minority in another in a, some European country, let's say. Not that there aren't problems there as well, of course, but, you know, do, do you see what I mean? And I, I, where do you stand on that issue of, of the, the history of conflict, the, 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 the reality of the conflict with the Palestinians, the question of terrorism, all those, all those things which, which work to drive a wedge between Jews and Arabs from the Jewish side? I, uh, I'm, I'm, I have to say I don't like these questions, and I think this is the 1,000th time I get asked this question. I'm sure. And I, and I probably get it another 1,000 times afterwards. Uh, this is a very typical question that uh, many, unfortunately, many Israeli Jews from the right uh, ask this question uh, to justify not, not feeling guilty about being discriminatory. Uh, that you are maybe an extension of the enemy. Well, no, we're not an extension of the enemy. We have been loyal citizens to the state of Israel. Yes, we do have critique about Israel's policy regarding the West Bank and Gaza, as many Israelis from the left. And those Israelis from the left do not get punished by neglecting them, not collecting their garbage, allowing crime to increase dramatically, allowing car accidents to grow dramatically, discriminating, my children were discriminating, discriminated while your children were not discriminated. Using that excuse, it's only an excuse to grab more, more money and pour it in the Jewish towns and villages. It's lust for the resources by politicians that do not see the collective good of the state of Israel. They see the good of their political base, where they're going, they want to get more votes. They're not looking at what's good for Israel. Mm -hmm. What's good for Israel is for not to have only, you know, if, if I, you know, again, I'm not, a, I'm not a good uh, example, but I can tell you half of my neighbors are below poverty line. They have kids that they cannot send them to university. Why? Because they're not able, they were not able to get them private classes 
because the educational system in the Arab community gets per capita, per student, one third of what a Jewish student gets. I mean, how can a state justify that in, it invests in a three-year-old three shekels per Jewish child, one shekel per Arab child? What is, what, how the, can this serve the Jewish national interest? How can this serve creating love in my heart to the Jewishness of the state? This is anti-Israeli. This does this service to the state of Israel. Israel needs to be able to invite us in to create space to us. Israel needs to show the rest of the Arab world that it's trying to make peace with them. Try to show them, how do you want to live with the rest of the Arabs? Prove it in your square one. Prove it home. Prove it where you have absolute full control. You don't have anyone involved here. It's only Israeli law that's involved. So do we have critical issues against the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and Israel trying to prevent the Palestinian state from happening? We do have. But are we out there in war with Israel? Are we out there in war with the Jews? Do you know that today in the town of Umm al-Fahim, where the Islamic movement is, part, is considered to be the strongest, 50% of the people that were vaccinated in the clinics of Umm al-Fahim, 50% were Jews. They came in to the town of Umm al-Fahim. They got vaccinated. Many of them even bought falafel or shawarma. And they went home happy and safe. We're not at, at war with you. We have a political debate. And that political debate cannot be used as an excuse for discrimination. It cannot be used as an excuse to look at Israeli citizens as grade two or class two citizens. I think that part of this is among certain circles is racist. Part of it, as President Rivlin said, it's negligence. Part of it is lust. And part of it is a dark eye. I'll give you uh, an interesting uh, Example, uh, one time I was meeting with the Director General of the Ministry of Finance, and uh, I was talking to him about, you know, why is, why is the government not helping small businesses in the Arab community? And his answer was, well, we don't know about small businesses in the Arab community. It was a Friday. So on Thursday, the next day, I said to him, come with me, I'll take you, and I'll show you. So I took him Friday, I'm sorry, Thursday, Friday he calls, he says, can I bring my wife and daughter tomorrow, the next day? So Saturday we took him for a family visit, started seeing the potential of Arab entrepreneurs that want to create businesses. And on Sunday, he allocated five, five million shekels, about one and, one and a half million dollars for some kind of an investment fund to start helping businesses. Today, those businesses are paying taxes to the state of Israel. Hmm. They're not paying it to the Palestinian Authority. They're not paying to the paying it to Jordan. Every new Arab university graduate improves the economy of the state of Israel. Every happy Arab citizen means that he is less likely to be in crime, he's less likely to be antisocial, he's less likely to be anti-anything. 88% of Arab citizens accept the de definition of the state of Israel as Jewish and democratic. 91% of Arab citizens are willing to sign today on the Declaration of Independence as a basic law, hmm. higher than that of the Jewish population. More Arab citizens today are willing to sign the Declaration of Independence as a law, to make it a law, than the percentage of Jewish citizens. We continue to hold on the basic foundations of the state, that Jewish and democratic are equal. Our battle is not with the Jewish and democratic. Our battle is that there is an attempt to try to create hierarchy between Jewish and democratic. The deal that my grandfather got was that this is democracy is as equal to the Jewishness of the state. The, for the, the, the state would serve as a homeland for the Jewish people. But it also meant to me that this is my homeland too. I'm not going to give up 
the fact that this is my homeland. So yes, the Jews can claim that they deserve collective rights because of the Jewishness of the state. You, you can keep the national anthem. Shabbat is the, the official day of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, the, of the weekend. Uh, the law of return, uh, the national anthem, but I also deserve collective rights, such as maintaining our my, my my indigenous language. Why do I have to? You know, I didn't immigrate to Israel. Israel immigrated to me. It needs to accept me. I'm willing to accept it, but it needs to accept me as well. I'm not a stranger. I'm not a foreigner. My kids that I'm talking to you about are 28th generation in the same village. You know, Jews claim history, rightfully so, why they are connected to this land. Well, I have my quite piece of history also. 28th generations in the same spot. When I go to the graveyard, which is 20 yards away from my house, I have my 26th generations buried there. I belong here. This is my, first of all, this is my country. This is my homeland. I want it to be my state also, not only the state of the Jews. Thank you very much. That was a, that was a, a, a very um, uh, impassioned and important response. Um, I want to go to questions. Uh, I, I, there's a million questions I could ask myself, but I want to give other people the opportunity uh, to ask. So I'm going to turn to some of the questions that have, that have come up uh, from the audience. Um, there was a question which I think relates to uh, some of the things you're talking about, the, some of the things you were talking about just now, actually, uh, which is a reference to the nation state law, um, which was passed in 2019, I believe, um, in Hebrew. Um, 2018. 2018, sorry. 19th of July, 2018. Okay. Um, can you, uh, this is obviously very contentious, um, both in Israel and outside, uh, it was passed by a very narrow majority um, in the Knesset. Um, and one of the most contentious elements of it was um, the, uh, the accusation or perception or reality, you'll tell me from your perspective, um, of the uh, degrading of the Arab language, which is something you mentioned just now. Can you say something about the nation state law? Has it made discrimination worse? Is it is it more symbolic than real in terms of what it actually, in terms of the difference it makes or not? Again, you're, you're trying to push me to be passionate again. When you talk about discrimination, I get passionate because you know, it, it touches my heart and it touches my kids. And uh, I, I, do not, uh, I do not volunteer to, be, to accept the status of second class citizen. And that's why I get passionate about it. And unfortunately, the nation state law tries to make discrimination uh, legal in Israel. Uh, it attempts to create, uh, actually to cement the two layer society. Arab citizens are secondary to those of Jewish citizens, meaning that equality becomes abs almost non-relevant. Uh, so first of all, the spirit of the law that it sees a Jewish citizen as more legitimate than an Arab citizen. It eliminates Arabic language from being an official state, which has been uh, an official language, which has been the case in, since 1948. It's not downgrading Arabic language, it's downgrading me as an Arab citizen. It's trying to say to me, your culture, your identity, what comes of my mouth every day to talking to my wife and kids is not illegitimate, it's not, indigenous to this country, that this country wants only to worship the Hebrew language, to cherish the Hebrew culture, and as if my language and my culture has no place in it. Instead of maturing after 70 years, expanding its arms, reflecting its known true nature. Israel says I'm a Jewish state. Well, I'm sorry to say it's not only a Jewish state. It's not only. This village is inside Israel. So if you consider is if you do consider it part of Israel, come hear the language in the street. It's not Hebrew. So the laws need to reflect the identity, the real identity. Don't lie to yourself. 
the nation state law lies, you know, tells people the lie that they like to believe. They, they make a lie and they like, they start believing that lie. Israel is not only a Jewish state. Israel is also the state of its citizens. De facto, this is happening. De facto, Israel is treating me as a citizen. It gives me a passport. It gives me the right to vote to the Knesset and decides who's the prime minister, who's going to be the next minister of defense. We're part of that kind of decision making. We, we even vote on who's a Jew. That's part of the laws that were passed in the Knesset. So de facto, we are part of the system, but the system is lying to itself by saying we're only Jewish. So. When you start trying to take it and you look at the trickle down effect of the nation state law, unfortunately, it does have a trickle down effect. It's not only feel good for the Jewish people, it's not only massaging the identity aspect of the Jewish people by making the Jews feel good. Hey, we announced that it's now the state of the Jews only, so we won. Who did you win it from? You won it from yourselves because you are the only majority that voted for it. It was only Jewish majority that voted it. No one else has been part of accepting that kind of law, except the 62 members of the Knesset that voted on it. But the trickle down effect is the dangerous part because it is being used and it allows itself to be used in order to discriminate in funding for what they call uh, settlement. So they want to help Jewish settlement. So how do you want to help Jewish settlement? History teaches us that the way Israel helped the Jewish settlement was to come confiscate Arab lands from the Galilee, to build outposts for Jewish settlements, to build factories only in Jewish settlements and not in Arab towns, to make bypass roads, uh, bypass roads around Arab villages that sometimes do not even have an exit to that Arab town, and it only serves the Jewish towns in them. So instead of helping Jewish and Arab neighbors to really start getting closer to each other, settlement activity in the past created more and more dis distinction, uniqueness, separation between the Jewish and the Arab populations. I want Israel to, from my point of view, I have no problem with Israel being the nation state, the homeland of the Jewish people. But it needs to also recognize that it's the homeland of its Arab citizens. I don't want it to be binational state. I want it to be the nation state of the Jewish people, but also to be the homeland of its own citizens. I am not willing to accept being non-legitimate citizen. I'm not renting space in Israel. I'm also homeowner. And the state and the nation state law says no, that doesn't happen. That's not legitimate. And not only that, that it, it is it allows itself to divide some perks which will be in, in shape of budget to Jews only. There was a decision that was passed by, by a court in Carmel a month ago. Mm -hmm. uh, some uh, Arab uh, residents of the Jewish town, Carmel, that has almost 10% uh, Arab population. And some of the kids from that town, some Jewish uh, students go to study outside Carmel and the municipality subsidizes their buses. But our kids that want to go study in some other out, out of town uh, schools, the municipality said, no, we're not going to subsidize their buses. Why? Because we are a Jewish town that is supposed to serve the Jews only. And they based their decision on the nation state law. Now, tell me this is not coming close to some of the worst ethnic regimes in history. The translation of the nation state law, the trickle down effect, if it continues, I don't know when, it's going to destroy totally the democratic nature of the state of Israel. It's going to make it more and more nationalist state and less and less civic state. So in, in my view, the danger for this is mostly to, to the Jewish democratic balance. It says that Jewish and democratic cannot coexist together. 
That's what the nation state law, law says. Jewish and democratic cannot work. So it's better for Israel to rethink that law and eliminate it from the textbooks of the, of the, of the state of Israel to maintain the, the democratic nature equivalent in value to the Jewish nature. Okay, so let, let, let's, let's get a little into politics, especially as we have an election coming up um, in, a, in a couple of months, number four in a, in a short period of time. Um, so the current situation for um, the Arab parties in Israel, for those that aren't aware, is that there is one um, Arab, uh, there's one joint list called the Joint Arab List, um, in Israel, in the, in the Knesset, which unites um, four different factions, which previously had run separately, but, but united because the threshold of the Knesset was, was raised um, and it was feared that, that um, uh, the Arab parties, at least some of them, would not, get, would not pass that threshold were they to run separately. So they're running as one joint list, even though they're actually divided it quite significantly on a number of um, um, ideological issues. There are secular parties and Islamist parties and, and nationalist parties um, there. Um, but I think one of the one of the things which perhaps is not appreciated because uh, people just see the joint list and they and they make this assumption of, of uh, some sort of shared ideology. There is that diversity within the joint list, um, and now we're seeing some. Uh, disagreement about willingness to work with Netanyahu or not from some figures within the joint list. Um, can you speak to Can you speak to that situation within the the Arab joint list, and also perhaps about whether um, how how should the Arab um, community deal with the question of its political representation in the Knesset, um, in, including given what you said about the. Um, and we see as well about the, 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 the desire for the Arab population to become increasingly integrated into Israeli society. Um, and in the, in the political representation, it seems to me, and um, you can argue with me if you want, um, but it seems to me that at least some, certainly not all, but at least some of the members of the joint list, perhaps a particular faction, um, are more antagonistic towards um, Israel as a Jewish state or the, the Jewishness of the state, Zionism as an idea, those sorts of things which make Jewish Israelis feel um, threatened. Um, how would you, how do you, would you respond to that? Okay, b before I respond to that, I want to first of all apologize to the many wonderful people that are asking questions in chat. And uh, my, you know, my brain is not able to take your questions and the chat questions and speak at the same time together. No, I'm going to get asked as many of those as I can. But what I do promise is that if you email me those questions, I'm happy to respond to them. And I'll, I promise I'll respond to each one of you. Uh, I'm not uh, avoiding them. I'm just uh, my attention cannot be divided sure. in three places. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, you know, the joint list is a new case in the Arab community. It only started in 2015. Before that, there were always four political parties that made all kinds of uh, fragmentations and combinations here and there. Uh, but usually it was two to three parties ran that ran separately. And in the first time they ran together in 2015, assuming that if they increase their power, that they will be counted uh, for potentially coalition building or preventing co certain coalitions from happening. Uh, this have, has proved to be a, a false case. Uh, and uh, the last elections proved that although there were uh, 15 seats in the Knesset, uh, where the, or the all four parties were together, they made recommendation on, on Benny Gantz. But uh, Benjamin Netanyahu says that uh, there were only 105 seats that are legitimate in the Knesset to be counted as part of the coalition making and not 120, basically completely delegitimizing the 15 Arab members of the Knesset. Well, part of it is that for him, this makes it, this is his real politique to make it, uh, to eliminate 15 seats from the center left block. So it becomes an easier uh, claim for him that he wants to create a government based on Jewish majority 
and not the majority of the members of the Knesset. That's his claim. The second part was a, a failure of the joint list and its components in convincing the mainstream Israeli Jewish public that they do deserve a seat on the table. Uh, and to convince them, it means that you need to control your rhetoric, uh, the language that you use. If you want to be integrated, you need to speak integrative language. You need to show that uh, you, you want to be part of building the country and not destroying the country. You know, some of the members of the Knesset uh, are expressing uh, statements that are very, would be very embarrassing, for example, for Benny Gantz uh, to take them in. Uh, sometimes they are even seen as if they are uh, siding with the, with the enemy uh, or incitement. Uh, again, I must say that this is uh, maybe uh, descriptive to maybe three members out of the 15, but the fact that they are seen as legitimate of that coalition of 15 other members of the Knesset, it taints the whole 15 with that kind of image of not being legitimate or too far to the left in, in the Israeli political scene. It seems that the Arab community is getting sick of this. Uh, when you ask the Arab citizens, what do you want from your members of the Knesset? You see that uh, almost 92% want them to deal with social economic uh, integration issues, with issues of uh, public safety, uh, education, housing, uh, they have their priorities uh, clear. Uh, and 91%, 92%, their priorities are not cross-border issues. Not even the peace with the Palestinians and not uh, the peace with the, with the Emirates and not the war with Iran. 91% say, now here, in our own, we want to look at our own backyards, our own streets and our, uh, the mobility of our children in the job market and educational market in Israel. And when the Arab parties have traditionally been uh, in the opposition and now they are strategically deciding to be part of the coalition, one of the members of the Knesset, her name is Hiba Yazbek, said, for example, about a month ago, well, what do you expect from us speaking in Arabic? We are not only an opposition, we are an opposition inside the opposition. So why are you going to the Knesset? If you do not seek full engagement, all in, if you do not seek to be fully engaged in the political game, step aside, allow those that want to go and play the political game. So maybe you shouldn't, you should boycott the elections if, if you want to keep yourself into the side on the sidelines the whole time. Uh, this has shown in the last uh, polls a, sig a, a significant damage uh, to the joint list. They are dropping from 15 seats, if it, you know, in, in the upcoming elections, uh, to somewhere around 10 seats. They're losing one third of their power within eight months. Uh, a new poll that I saw just about an hour ago indicates that they're going to get somewhere around 8.2 seats and not 15. So the Arab public is punishing them at least in polls right now, which is creating space for a few scenarios. One is split off of the joint list between those that are more willing to engage, basically get rid of those that are holding them back from engagement, you know, including, for example, the flirting between Mansour Abbas from the Islamic movement and Benjamin Netanyahu in the last couple of months. Mm. They want to basically say, okay, let's split this, being all together means that our common denominator is very, very low, does not allow us to be effective in the Israeli politics. Another scenario can keep them and stick together, but this will mean this means there are five to seven seats that are up for grab, which will allow either parties such as the Likud and uh, such as the Atid and such as Meretz to even re engage themselves with the Arab community. Uh, the Likud, Benjamin Netanyahu said today in a phone call to Ali Salam, the mayor of Nasser, he invited him to be a candidate on his list. And he said that he wants to have an Arab member of the Knesset in his list to the Knesset. And he is promising to, appo to appoint an Arab minister in his future government. Basically, he's trying to flirt 
with those seven seats that are floating right now in the Arab community. It's a huge number of seats. Meretz changed its list from none, not a single Arab in their top six in the last elections. Now they have two Arab candidates in their top five. Forty percent of their of their candidates are Arab. Uldai, uh, the mayor of Tel Aviv, is looking at integrating three Arab uh, uh, citizens in his uh, political party in his top ten. Basically, again, trying to uh, talk to those floating uh, uh, seats. Still, what's worrying, what's concerning, is that when you ask people, are you willing to vote in the next elections? The turnout rate today seems to be somewhere around 47%, uh, when it was 64% in the last elections. One third of the voters are saying, we're not, we, don't, we don't want to play this game at all. The political game, even when we uh, flock the ballots and we come uh, with full intention to participate in the political game, there's a glass ceiling. Not Gantz is willing to take us, not Netanyahu is willing to take us, so why even play? So many of those are basically standing on the line. The fourth scenario that might come, and I'm, uh, I'm sharing a bit of a secret, is the emergence of a new Arab political party that will be announced, might be announced, I have to be careful, might be announced tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, and might, I, I personally might have some kind of a role in it. I can't say more than that before 4 p.m. tomorrow. Okay, we, you, got, you guys got an exclusive there. Um, okay, um, I'm gonna, I wanna try and combine some of the questions that have come in so, so that people will get their um, questions, questions just, asked. Just one thing, I need to be off in about three to four minutes uh, because I have- Ah, okay. So All right, so let's-, so let's We so planned let's, it for, hour, for one hour and- Understood. Okay, so let's do this. Firstly, if you, Mohammed, if you can write in the chat your email address, of course. And, then we, and then people can take that down and email you questions that they have that are not answered. And then I'm going to ask just one question, um, which um, which I think which to try and unite. There are a whole bunch of questions concerning um, the uh, sort of economic and employment and education questions. Um, so uh, can you speak to firstly about whether you think it's a mistake that there was set that, that, that in the beginning of the state of Israel, there were separate education systems um, and, and how you were, uh, uh, what, what your view is on that. And also about whether the increased number of Arab students going to Israeli, going to university, how are they being responded to by the Jewish students? Are they integrating socially and culturally as well as educationally? Well, thank you for the question. I, uh, I've dedicated my life for uh, the creation of integrated educational systems or cross-sector type of social, cultural, municipal programs. That, that's been my career, as well as trying to do the, uh, the peaceful battle for equality. You know, uh, So I do echo Paul Lips is here. I see you. Hi, Paul. Uh, Paul knows me for many, many years. Uh, I haven't seen you in years, Paul. But uh, I, I say in order to create what's called the shared society, you need two things. You need good relations between Jews and Arabs, and you need equality between Jews and Arabs. Now, Jews and Arabs see this differently. They say yes, and, th and there's still a majority. Almost 65% of the Jews are willing to they accept equality and they accept good relations. In the Arab community, it's almost 88% that are willing to accept this package of good relations and equality. Now, we differ in what we see comes first. Most Jews say good relations first. This will lead towards equality. Most Arab citizens say equality first. This will lead to good relations. Basically, we're standing on the lines waiting for each other to come forward. I believe that it's about time to start relating to those two values as two equal values to work in parallel lines. So when we talk about, uh, this, about stereotypes, most stereotypes in Israel are made during the years 12 to 18. 
while you're in school. In a segregated educational system, one, separate is not equal. It seems that it can never be equal. And two, in an atmosphere of the regional conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, all non-Jews are part of the enemy. So Arab citizens are seen part of the enemy. All Jews are seen as part of the oppressors in the West Bank and Gaza. So you start developing, you start demonizing the other, and it starts, it allows an increased sense of racism. So we need to create more and more integration. I've tried it a few times. Once uh, in, uh, I started in 2005 a project which uh, takes Jewish te uh, Arab teachers in Jewish schools and Jewish teachers in Arab schools. I said, okay, if we can integrate the schools, there are a few seven integrated schools out of 4,800. So the second best that I tried was what, what I call cross-sector teachers exchange. Let's bust the children if we can't, let's, let's bust the teachers if we can't bust the children. When I started the pilot in 2006, 2005, I started with six teachers. Today, we have 1,300 teachers. 1,000 Arab teachers teach in Jewish schools and 300 Jewish teachers teach in Arab schools. Now, that's not what's important. What is important is the result. After two years of having a teacher from the other side in your life, First of all, 93% of the kids report this is their first meaningful interaction with the other, meaning it's not superficial. You know, you see someone in the street or you see someone in the shopping center, that's not an interaction. That's not that's a superficial interaction. Mm. A meaningful interaction is where you're, when you're able to engage with them with something, either a discussion or like your daughter Yasmin on Sunday, having my niece as her uh, as her dentist. That comes closer to meaningful interaction if you allow identities also to emerge and not only service to be, to be provided. The, uh, so 93% of them report a uh, first encounter and 68% of those 93% report that this encounter made them feel more positive about the other. And this, this change lasts for more than three years. We, we checked it three years later, it stayed. Among 92% of them, it stayed. So in order to work about on Jewish Arab relations, it's not the big capital P politics. It's the small P politics. I always say, I don't want peace. I want pieces of peace. That's how you make peace. We have 384,000 kids in Israel today that have a teacher from the other side that meets them every morning. Those 384,000 kids are growing up to be different kind of Israelis. The Arabs are growing up to realize that Jews can be their teachers when they're very young. They're with them every day. Hebrew is legitimate. Shabbat is legitimate and is part of their life. Sukkot is part of their life. Uh, Hanukkah, the, the teacher brings them uh, Sofganyot. They, they do culture sharing, which allows them to relate to Jewish culture as, as part of their normal scene. It becomes normal. The same thing with the Jewish kids that have an Arab teacher. So suddenly that Arab teacher is not the politician that makes them angry. It's not that terrorist that shoots from uh, Beirut or from uh, Lebanon on Israel, they're an Arab for them, they have someone immediate that they can talk to. It could be a woman that came with, that has dyed her hand with henna the day before because her brother was married, got married. And they ask her, what, what is this? They get exposed to some kind of, something new that happens in Israel. They're not even aware of it. Mm. They get exposed to, parts of the Israeli culture that they've never heard. They, they suddenly hear the name of the nearby mountain in Arabic and they've never even heard it. It, it exposes them to the real structure and the real fabric of the state of Israel. And I see that's our way forward.
Thank you very much. That's a wonderfully uh, hopeful, uh, positive way to finish. I know you have to run. Can you, uh, Mohammed? Can you write your your email in the chat? I did. Oh, you did it. Okay. I okay. I, I will uh, copy it and put it again. Wait, I can't see it here. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so write me, and I'll get back to you. I must uh, leave you. You have to go. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, Mohammed. Great you. pleasure. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, um, I'm writing my email also in the chat for those that don't have it um, and want to join my mailing list. Um, if you didn't get Mohammed's email, you can get it from me. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have time for all the questions. Uh, I know he had to run. Uh, he's very busy, I think, possibly related to the, uh, <laughs> to the announcement that he, that he gave us uh, earlier um, about uh, political developments that he's involved in. Um, I can tell you that, so that concludes our four part series. Um, all the previous episodes are available on YouTube. Um, you can find them at the Begin Center, on the Begin Center channel on YouTube. If you just go into the Begin Center channel and write four tribes, uh, you'll see the other three videos if you've not seen those. Um, as I said, if you email me, I can also send you those links. Um, next week, we have a special webinar which is connected to the project um, that we started last week. For those of you that were here last week when we heard from Dan Murray, Dora, Malcolm Honline. Next week, we're, we're um, going to speak to Natan Sharansky. Um, so um, those, on, those of you on my main, mailing list will get the details from me. Uh, the details will also be on our website and our Facebook page in English. Um, again, email me if you wish to be on my mailing list and are not. Um, I hope you'll agree that it was a very um, interesting uh, and informative um, conversation with Mohammed. Um, it's an issue which uh, it's really at the heart, I think, of much of the social debate in Israel and probably gets buried um, beneath some of the, the issues which are more, um, which are, I think are more pertinent to the diaspora Jewish conversation, sometimes around religion and state. Um, those are things which I think we tend to talk about more uh, in, in diaspora because they relate to um, uh, Israel-diaspora relations. But inside Israel itself, um, we're talking about, um, you know, 20% of the population and a, uh, and a, real, um, uh, a real question of how to move forward uh, in a way that benefits uh, both the people, Jews and Arabs, um, and the state of Israel um, as a whole. So thank you all for joining. I hope you found it interesting as I did. And I hope to see you all on future sessions. Um, goodbye. Have a good evening or good day. <laughs>